the 1900s, Liberia, the only independent West African nation, was a prosperous one. The Republic was productive and Liberians were engaged in skilled practices such as cotton spinning, clay molding and farming, while foreign companies invested heavily into rubber plantations and mining of iron ore. The economy grew quickly. It became evident that the power generated from the fuel sources could not meet the demand of the emerging economy. It was time the nation looked for alternative energy sources. Development was coming up so greatly, and, and these dams, these uh, diesel machines were not able to withstand the, uh, the load, the demand from the communities. And as such, you know, hydro became a priority. In 1961, President Tubman visited the U.S. and five projects were agreed. The JFK Hospital, the Monrovia Consolidated School System, water and sewer, water plant, sewer plant, and the Mount Coffee Hydro. They went ahead and studied the St. Paul River and designed a hydro. With the support of the United States government, Liberia embarked on the construction of a $24 million hydropower plant. The construction began in 1964, and the plant was built on the St. Paul River. You know, from getting power supply from diesel plant that has uh, so many failures or so, to a hydro plant that has high reliability, the Liberian people were very, very happy. Mount Coffee was completed and inaugurated in 1967. It was dedicated to President William V.S. Tubman. In Inaugurating the plant, the plant was named the Walter F. Walker and T.J. R. Faulkner Hydroelectric Power Plant. The plant was named in honor of both men as they had contributed immensely to the realization and negotiations of the hydro plant. The plant later became popularly known as the Mount Coffee Hydro Plant because of the coffee crops that populated the region. Mount Coffee got its name from the planting of coffee. If you take the road going behind Bensonville towards Todi, you will see the hills in the distance. They still call that place Coffee Mountain. Most of the wild bush there is coffee. The plant generated an initial capacity of 30 megawatts in power output. Due to the demand for more power, the capacity of Mount Coffee was increased by an additional 34 megawatts bringing the total power to 64 megawatts in 1973. Liberia had attracted many investors due to the availability of abundant electricity. Industrialization became the hallmark of the nation's advancement, creating employment opportunities for more Liberians. Infrastructure development was on the rise and the nation became a destination for tourists. It was an era of prosperity for all Liberians, and for 23 years, the Mount Coffee Hydro Plant steadily supplied the electricity that kept the wheels of the nation spinning. Tragically, the glorious days of Liberia were cut short when the war broke out in 1989. Properties were destroyed, and many companies were shut down. Basic social services, including electricity from Mount Coffee Hydro Plant, were affected. Nathaniel Brown, who worked as a plant operator at Mount Coffee Hydro Power Plant, was on site when the rebels took over. He recalls his experience. I saw one of them with this to do hair all here and that close. But that man telling me, look, get out from there. Planting the gun at me and then say to us, put your hands on your head and move out of the plant. Workers were forced out by rebels, leaving the plant shut down and unattended. The spillway gates were left closed 
and that caused an increase in the water level. Due to water flowing over the top of the dam for several days, the dam eroded and eventually failed, and water flooded into the powerhouse. By the time the Civil War came to an end in 2003, almost the entire system of electrical infrastructure in Liberia had been destroyed. With no hydroelectric power and a damaged transmission and distribution system, Liberia could no longer provide electricity to its citizens, bringing a major setback in the economy. Hospitals could not operate as they had before. The absence of electricity made it incredibly difficult to cater to the needs of patients. The lack of consistent power forced medical professionals to do without lights and equipment that are necessary to deliver adequate health care. Students struggled to study, and only determined ones went the extra mile to study by candlelight and kerosene. Business owners had no choice but to raise the price of commodities, forcing consumers to pay for the high cost of the generators that ran their businesses. Right now, each of the machines that we have has its own engine, and we have to provide fuel for that. So we have to spend up to $13, $15 per day for each machine. Uh, and so that seriously impacts the cost of the product. Street corners were dark at night, giving criminals even more opportunity to operate. As a result, many residents of Liberia stayed indoors after dark, and the empty streets affected businesses that operated after hours. We buy gas, about four gallons per day, buy ice, and we're not getting anything. We just send it because we don't want a place to be closed down. But it gives you a tough time because there is no current. Some residents had the misfortune of losing their homes to fires caused by the open flames they relied on. The government needed to act in order to end the suffering of its citizens. Then an internationally renowned woman stood up for the challenge. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, known as the Iron Lady, was elected president in 2005, and many Liberians looked to her as a beacon of hope. She made the restoration of Liberia's energy sector a top priority. We must meet our commitment to restore some measure of electricity to our capital city. We must put Liberians back to work again. She brought together a consortium of donors to undertake an emergency power program. In 2007, with just two megawatts of diesel generators, the Liberia Electricity Corporation, LEC, was revived. For the first time since the war, they started commercial operation with 450 customers and a row of streetlights. We have kept part of the promise as we turn on these lights. And we know that working together, to use the same worn out phrase, small lights today, big lights today. Though an inspiring start, Liberia still had a very long way to go to expand access to electricity, reduce the high cost of LEC power, which costs 59 cents per kilowatt hour, and find a more reliable and environmentally friendly energy source. The need for hydropower was clear. Liberia is a, call it a country with river bodies. Hydro has to be our best option. Well, hydro is also expensive, much beyond Liberia's own domestic financial capacity to something. So can we get investment? That's what we need. By 2011, Madame Salif was able to garner the support of the government of Norway, the government of Germany through KFW, and the European Investment Bank to fund the rehabilitation of the Mount Coffee plant. 
the government of Norway initiated a meeting in November 2011 to agree on the project terms. Patrick Sandolo participated in the negotiations of the financing agreements. Financing the project was the, the number one challenge from the beginning. And, and in fact, from the first time we, be, we, 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 we got involved with the project, you know, everybody kept on talking, well, let's do my coffee, let's do my coffee. And then once people heard the price tag, you know, then everybody stopped talking about it because it was prohibitive. I mean, even at the time. One of the things that happened from the very inception with respect to funding was that we had a project that I think all of the donors recognized was an important project for the country. The commercial customers can get reliable electricity to carry on with their lives, to carry on with their businesses, to carry on with their hospital businesses, to carry on with their commercial activities, whatever. That's what's missing. I still remember the first time we went to the Mount Coffee substation. It was really in the middle of the jungle. We didn't know what we will find. Yeah, we saw this broken down powerhouse with these pits. Yeah, it was amazing for me as engineer to see the situation of this power plant there. Yeah, this 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 great gap in the dam, and to to reflect on the history of of this power plant, how it was built in the 60s, and then became destroyed beginning in the 90s, and then looted in 2003, yeah, somewhere around. And he convinced me directly yeah, that this is a great project and we wanted really to go on with this. And since then, we, we really teamed up to make this project happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the President, Her Excellency, uh, Madame Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, received the Nobel Peace Prize, which is given out in Norway, uh, and the government of Norway and uh, Her Excellency started discussing whether there were programs that we could support in Liberia. Uh, Norway is a hydropower nation. We know how to deal with hydropower. All our country was built on hydropower. And she talked about Mount Coffee and the story of Mount Coffee. And um, the Minister of Development at that time, he was very keen on the project and I was working for him. So actually we went together on a helicopter trip uh, about the old ruins of, uh, of what was left of Mount Kofi. And he looked at me and he said, Hege, this is going to be quite a job. The country was in dire need of the electricity after, uh, uh, after all of the uh, electricity network had been destroyed in the civil wars. And uh, idea uh, behind of this one was to bring back the country uh, to its two standing feet. The hope and the vision is that this project is for the benefit of the people of Liberia. The goal is to bring cheap and reliable energy to the people and uh, that is the vision that we want to see the use of the power of by the people, by the industry, by the administration, uh, to get things done. The momentum to restore the Mount Coffee hydro plant grew, and in 2015, the Millennium Challenge Corporation joined the project as a funder. MCC's commitment is to identify investments that can reduce poverty, and this is an area that we can make a material contribution to the supply of reliable and low-cost energy. And Mount Coffee has that opportunity to provide this type of energy and be a platform for future energy development in Liberia. When you look at a country, you cannot continue to export only raw materials. Meaning, if you export raw rubber, for example, then you're buying rubber slippers, rubber buckets. Uh, you're exporting it for pennies on the dollars, and now you have to buy it back. So as a result, the foreign exchange is not adequate. But the only way to bring that down is not to be able just to be able to sell rubber shoes. You must be able to make rubber shoes. When you talk about industrialization being important, that's why so we can employ more Liberians. The GDP itself can go up. But then in addition to that, we can tap access to what Mount Coffee has given us, which is uh, reliable energy. Liberia received approximately $340 million for the implementation of the project, with a 41% of the funding coming from the United States. 
20% from Norway, 19% from the government of Germany through KFW, and 18% from the European Investment Bank. The Liberian government contributed 2%. With the funding secured, the project got underway. The government of Liberia requested that the government of Norway finance a project implementation unit, or PIU, to ensure that LEC would have the necessary expertise to oversee the work. Norway was already financing a management contract at LEC with Manitoba Hydro International. So this contract was expanded to include the PIU. Norway was the sole funder of the PIU with a contribution of approximately 15 million United States dollars. MHI immediately began the work of planning out the fast track project while setting up the PIU and hiring staff. Christine Straub, a member of the PIU team, served as the director for operations for the project. President Sirleaf really wanted to turn on Mount Coffee by Christmas of 2015 so that she would give it as a present to the Liberian people. And that really gave us just over three years to implement the whole project. The PEIU had two main objectives, to commission the first generating unit of the Mount Coffee Hydro Power Plant by December 2015, and to ensure that the LEC staff would be properly trained to operate the power plant. Recognizing the long lead time for manufacturing turbines and generators, the PIU began with two priorities in parallel, contracting an owner's engineer and contracting the generating equipment supplier. Norplan and Fitchner, a joint venture company, was contracted as the owner's engineer, and the planning and design for the construction work got underway. The owner's engineer is a team of experts that is responsible for the planning, design, and supervision of the construction work on behalf of the project owner. The early priorities of a power station were to review existing documents. This proved a challenge because a lot of the original documents were no longer around. The employer, the panel experts, and the funders identified the need to redesign the power station not based on its original design, which was a two-phase process in the 60s and 70s, but rather go forward and improve performance station, which is the route we followed. Our first task was to start to assess the condition of the plant. And we had read, we had read about the powerhouse before we got there, but I don't think it could really prepare us on what your first impression of the powerhouse really was, because it was a remnant of an old powerhouse. It was really a skeleton overgrown by reforestation. We only had like the pillars and the columns of the powerhouse itself and all of the non-embedded parts of the generator and the turbines were just removed. So the powerhouse had been really been stripped clean. Because the task of bringing affordable and reliable electricity was an urgent one, the key priority of the project was the schedule. The only way for the team to achieve this goal was to plan and implement the project at the same time. The PIU and owner's engineer came up with a procurement strategy which divided the construction work into separate contracts which could run in parallel and reduce potential delays. We opted for a very traditional form of procurement with pre-qualification, technical evaluation afterwards, and only at the end, opening of prices. And it was quite interesting because uh, a lot of donors also active in Africa said, this will never function. Yeah? It's, uh, you will get complaints directly from the beginning. And it was exactly the other way around. After a successful bidding process, the owner's engineer wasted no time in getting contractors to work. Voith Hydro of Germany was selected for the generating equipment contract. Voith undertook the first task, 
which was to open up the rusty spillway gates that had been stuck in place for almost two decades since they were closed in 1990. This will be an interesting project as we have to start with the installation of the bridge crane and then following up open the spillway gates. Uh, it was not too easy as the gates have been closed since a long time. It was important to allow the river to move freely before construction began. The next priority was to get the water out of the powerhouse so that the design of the equipment could be finalized. The project team created a contract for the construction of temporary dams to keep the powerhouse dry and safe to work in. This contract was awarded to Dornis International of the United Kingdom. And it was very sad to see the powerhouse in the state it was and we could tell there's a lot of work to be done um, to get the um, rehabilitation complete and power back to Monrovia as it was. The powerhouse had been abandoned for so long that it became a habitat for thousands of bats. Care had to be taken to safely remove them before construction could start. The project officially broke ground in January 2014. Meanwhile, work on procurement continued. In June of 2014, LEC signed a contract with Andritz Hydro of Austria for the hydraulic steelworks and auxiliary systems, which included the rehabilitation of the spillway gates and the intake gates in the powerhouse. We were really successful in the beginning in the procurement procedure and we could close a lot of contracts uh, very fast, yeah, even to quite good prices in the beginning. And this, of course, I think was a key success factor of the fast implementation of the project. While the project was just starting to gain momentum, West Africa was struck by a major crisis, Ebola. A deadly virus, unknown to the region, invaded Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea and brought everything to a halt. The president declared a state of emergency in August 2014, which was when we had to make the difficult decision to um, get the international contractors out of Liberia. Over 11,000 people across the region lost their lives to Ebola. The crisis was a major setback for the economy of Liberia. The capacity of the health system was significantly reduced and could not meet the needs of the population. Then, there was a cry for international intervention. By October 2014, the United States, China, Germany, and other foreign partners got actively involved in fighting the deadly Ebola virus. While we were overseas, we were coming up with different strategies to try and save some time while not knowing how much time we were going to lose. During this time, the team completed the procurement for the construction of the substation at Mount Coffee and the upgrading of the LEC Bushroot and Painesville substations was awarded to the National Contracting Company of Saudi Arabia in December 2014. And one of the decisions that was taken was to break out the construction of the camp and give that to a national contractor who was already here in Liberia and wouldn't be afraid of returning before Liberia got its Ebola free status. Um, so we did that and they were able to start constructing the camp in April 2015. Following a competitive procurement, a Liberia-based joint venture of Pan-African Engineering, Sigma Group Incorporated, and Mamba Point Hotel, PSM, started the construction of the camp. It was built to house up to 250 staff at peak capacity. In addition to these contractors, hundreds of local workers were hired to build the camp. PSM had only a few months to get the camp up and running for the contractors who were preparing to mobilize for their construction works. 
look at our experts we have here. If they have to live in the Monroe, they come to work here every day. You travel on that road every day. You see the road conditions. If they have to live in Monroe, where would they stay? They would stay in hotel. So why would they would build accommodations here on site? I too live here on site, and it's a wonderful place to live. Meanwhile, Voice and Andrix were busy manufacturing the generating and hydraulic equipment overseas. Through perseverance, the country was declared free of Ebola on May the 9th, 2015. It brought a big relief to the people and government of Liberia. Unfortunately, the Ebola crisis caused the project to lose a year. It would no longer be possible to achieve the goal of first power by December 2015. But the project team committed to turning on the plant by December 2016. There was no room for delays. In May, LEC signed a contract with Eltel Networks of Sweden for the construction of two double-circuit high-voltage transmission lines from Mount Coffee to Bushroad and Painesville in Monrovia. That same month, LEC signed a contract with Donus International Limited for the main civil works, which included the important task of rebuilding the dam, as well as the powerhouse, the other main structures, and the roads. The rainy season created challenges, not only for the construction, but also for access. The two roads leading to the hydro plant were in a deplorable state. The main access route along Cordwell Road was impassable during the rainy season, which meant that people and equipment had to travel twice the distance on an alternative route. Bill Haken, project director of the PIU, had to find quick solutions to the problem. Well, Coldwell Road was quite honestly a disaster. I wouldn't really call it a road when we first arrived. In the rainy season, it was impassable for a lot of the time. Um, so I realized right from the very beginning that it was going to be necessary to upgrade that road so that it would accept all the big loads that we had to uh, transfer from the port of Monrovia to the site. Um, we're talking about transformers especially, uh, 70 tons each. They can be damaged if they receive too much shock during transport. So it was crucial that we upgraded the road. The bridges leading to the site on both of the main access routes were not wide or strong enough to accommodate the heaviest equipment. The government of Liberia and the World Bank, through a separate initiative, solved the problem. A new bridge was built in Cordwell, and this came at the right time for the project. The bridge was completed just in time for delivery of the first generating equipment. By December 2015, all contractors were mobilized and on site. Donus began rehabilitating the section of the dam that was washed away. The race was on to reach the first major milestone. By late 2015, the project site was like an ant colony. Everyone was working to achieve a common goal, restoring Liberia's hydropower. Andritz began reinforcing the spillway gates, which control the reservoir level by regulating how much water is released back into the river. Andritz also worked on the intake gates on the powerhouse, the entry point for water to reach the turbines from the reservoir. Both intake and spillway gates were sandblasted and refurbished, strengthening them and ridding them of corrosion. First of all, we had to deal with, with the local weather conditions. Doing painting works and also welding works during rainy season uh, came to a very big challenge. So we had, we had to, to gain ideas how to seal all this, this space where we were working off to keep the rain away, to keep the condition for painting uh, in a, an acceptable range. So this was one of the major challenges we had, we had to face here. Voith began the task of removing the old runners and other damaged 
generating equipment so that the turbine pits could be modified to hold the new, modern, higher capacity turbines. Meanwhile, Donna's workers were rehabilitating the tunnels called the penstocks and the draft tubes. Through the penstocks, water from the reservoir will flow from the intake gates to get to the massive turbines in motion. And from there, water travels through the draft tubes and exits into the tail race channel. Rain or shine, day or night, the work continued. The project managers had to beat all odds to ensure that the first turbine would be tested and commissioned on schedule. With hundreds of construction workers on site, the paramount concern for the PIU and the owner's engineer was safety. Being you a contractor, an employee or visitor coming to site, coming to Mount Coffee Hydro, we take you this induction first. After the induction, we acknowledge your understanding by giving you a form to sign that you have passed through our induction. You have been familiarized with the risk matrix for the project. What type of risk are associated with the scope of work on the ground? And how can these risks be mitigated? We first of all provide our gears, personal protective equipment. These personal protective equipment are there to assist you in the hierarchy of controls for safety. The national contracting company was making progress on the substation. The first target under this contract was to complete the first of four bays, which contained the high voltage switching devices and transformers that connect the power station to the transmission system. It is from this bay that the first power from the plant would get sent to Monrovia. LTEL began erecting towers and stringing cables that would subsequently transfer the power from the Mount Coffee substation to the Bushwood Island substation and the Painesville substation. The transmission line between Mount Coffee and Bushwood Island had to be completed and ready for energization in order to carry power to Monrovia in December. Donna's work on an accelerated schedule to complete the reconstruction of the dam, which was their most important early milestone. The dam was substantially completed by the middle of 2016. By October 2016, Andritz had achieved operation of seven of the 10 spillway gates, which control the level of the reservoir, the area that holds the water that powers Mount Coffee. The process of filling the reservoir with water is known as impoundment. Coffer dams that stopped the flow of water upstream of the powerhouse had to be removed in preparation for the reservoir impoundment. Downstream coffer dams in the tail race channel also had to be removed so that the water could flow freely. Water from this reservoir would subsequently power the turbines in the powerhouse, and that is how the plant generates electricity. So the reservoir impoundment was a very important milestone for achieving first power by December 2016. To ensure that all residents living near the reservoir understood how the reservoir was being filled and to prepare them to take precautions during a catastrophic event such as an extreme flood, the PIU went from village to village around the reservoir and to 10 kilometers downstream from the dam, educating residents and helping them to identify safe zones beyond the reach of flood water. With funding from MCC to maintain uninterrupted access to schools, markets, jobs, and farms, the project constructed three steel bridges, over a dozen culverts, road upgrades, and two floating walkways around the reservoir so that the rising water would not cut any person off from his or her livelihood. 
Two of the bridges opened up a major access route on the west bank of the St. Paul River that had previously been impassable during the rainy season. Residents of James Moba Town received a steel pedestrian bridge to replace a dangerous bamboo crossing. You know, it's, a, it's a dream because thing that you are not seeing for a long time. A jail camp will kind of do it for you. So we are very more happy and it will help the people. Residents of small, remote villages around the reservoir were given canoes, which allowed them to maintain access to their sources of income after the reservoir was filled. The canoes added benefits for fishing. The PIU had to ensure that the people living around the reservoir and in the project area were compensated for any project impacts. During the 26 years when the hydropower plant lay dormant, these inhabitants took advantage of the fertile land and planted farms in the former reservoir. The PIU had to conduct extensive surveys in a 13 square kilometer area to assess losses of these farmers. Since the land belonged to LEC, no one lost private land and no houses were affected. General people move close to a river because there you have the most or the best soil due to, to flooding. So nutrition's come in and that's where they do their farms. Now we come with a reservoir, they have to leave out. So what we did is we measured all the farms and we counted the trees so that we could compensate them fairly. And the PIU didn't stop with compensation. After the farmers received their money and replacement land for farming, they received training on how to safeguard and invest their funds. And that he was telling you farming as a business. He will have business idea. And these are some of the ideas, you know, as a farmer. He said, what can I do oh, to cut down my cost? And I will make a profit. But you have to work as a group. Homeowners whose properties were within the corridor of the transmission lines also had to be compensated for their losses of assets. Though the routing of the lines was done so that no one would lose his or her house, the PIU was responsible for educating the people about the safety considerations of living near a transmission line. Identifying everyone was a challenge. We had places where we, we saw a mother deed and then there were um, several spots sold, but the owner of the mother deed didn't tell us. So the good thing where we went up and down the transmission line for several months, so it, neighbors met us and they told, hey, that's not right, the land belongs to someone else. In other cases, land were sold to two people. There were claims between different people. We decided that we do not want to get involved there. And we have said either they agree on a system for them, which suits for themselves, or they go to court, and then the, the court of Liberia needs to decide how, how to go forward. Over 1,200 people living in the project area and within the corridors of the two transmission lines had to be contacted and compensated over the life of the project. The project steadily moved forward. At the powerhouse, Voith engineers had fully assembled and installed the first turbine called Unit 1. To be sure that it had been installed properly, they had to test it numerous times. This process, known as dry commissioning, is undertaken without the flow of water through the turbines. After several tests, the Voith engineers were confident that they were ready to do the wet commissioning. Stop logs had to be removed from the intake gates and the tail race gates for the free flow of water. By mid-November, for the first time in over 25 years, Intake Gate 1 was raised and water from the reservoir made its way into the powerhouse to commence the wet testing of Turbine 1 in preparation 
for generating electric power. Tens of thousands of long working hours had been dedicated to reaching this point. The end goal of installing new turbines and generators and refurbishing the spillway gates, the intake gates, the entire powerhouse and the dam and building the substation and transmission lines were all geared towards this milestone, which would prove that the plant was ready for its first generation of power. Everyone was nervous. After hours of testing, the team was elated to find that the first unit had been assembled so precisely that the overspeed test caused hardly any vibration in the powerhouse, which can often occur when the turbine is spinning at 160% of its normal rate. There was really some kind of jubilation in the, in the assembly. Just people uh, say, we did, we did it. This was a major achievement for the project managers and contractors, and it meant that the project would be able to achieve President Sirleaf's goal of commemorating the hydropower plant as a Christmas present to the Liberian people. On December the 15th, 2016, at an elaborate program, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf hosted an array of government officials and international partners to commemorate the start of the Mount Coffee plant and the delivery of power to Monrovia. The completion of Mount Coffee is perhaps the finest manifestation of Liberians sticking what epitomizes the totality of the destruction wrought by war and overcoming it, of turning what was a grim tombstone of our savage war into a magnificent and living cathedral of progress and development. After more than four years of hard work, the Mount Coffee hydro plant was set to deliver clean energy to Monrovia from its first turbine, which has an installed capacity of 22 megawatts. Residents of Monrovia were poised to receive what they had desperately waited for. The partners that funded this initiative could see their donations at work. In spite of achieving the huge success of the first power, the job was not yet completed. Voith continued to work on the installation and testing of the remaining three generating units, while NCC had to complete the substation works for each of those remaining three units. Eltel constructed the Painesville transmission line to ensure that the 88 megawatts of power generated by all four units could be carried to all parts of Monrovia. Donors excavated the ground where an emergency spillway and bridge would be constructed in the late stages of the project. The height of the bridge and the dam crest were raised 2.3 meters higher than they were in 1990 when the dam was overtopped and breached. The purpose of the emergency spillway is to ensure that under similar conditions that had occurred in the early 90s, where the four bay dam was washed away, um, all the assets and the infrastructure of the project are protected. Teichmann Structures of South Africa was hired for the construction of the emergency spillway, the key piece of which is the weir. You don't want that water to flow over, so before it reaches the crest of the dam, the height of the weir is slightly below that, which will ensure that any water goes through this, this area first before it affects any of the other infrastructure. Tashman was also contracted to construct a 220-meter bridge over the emergency spillway, which created a secure access route through the sites for the surrounding communities. The rehabilitation of the Mount Coffee plant created over a thousand construction, service, maintenance, and administrative jobs for the people from the local communities, some of which will continue during plant operations. The residents of three villages located downstream of the emergency spillway had to be relocated to a safe zone. No one would be permitted to reside in that area for safety reasons. As a result, 
the project constructed a new settlement dubbed Unification Town for its combination of the three villages. At this time, we had then to resettle about 200 people. In total, there were 23 houses. It came about uh, the times for us to leave from this place. They said, look, every small, small thing you got here will be uh, counting in to compensate you people. And we all agree. Well, uh, with them, every step they took, each time they go one step, they will come for me here. I will go there and I look at it and I will carry my people too. They will go and see. So everybody was happy. The new houses included double pit latrines and hand pumps. I feel so fun because the difference is I don't have any sleep in my house. I will not have any toilet and bathroom. But they gave our toilet and bathroom along with sleeping our house. Our children will live better life because the place is very fun. So I feel so fun because of that. The PIU's work of safeguarding the environment and people around the project continued in 2017. A fish monitoring program was initiated to ensure that any impacts on aquatic life would be identified and mitigated. The PIU was also tasked with ensuring that the water quality in the St. Paul River and the reservoir was safe for people and for marine life. The PIU tested the river water at the beginning of the project and regularly throughout the life of the project to identify any changes. Because of this program, sanitation became a priority intervention. Prior to the commencement of the construction phase of the project, uh, we did a baseline water quality analysis. And at the time, the figure California level in the St. Paul was much lower. But during the construction period, we noticed that the figure California level increased because of the influx of uh, people coming in search of job. After noticing that, we took a step to rectify that situation. So we introduced a program called Community Layer Total Sanitation, where we went into the various communities, trying to encourage individuals to build their personal latrine. And we did not only stop there, we started constructing hand pumps for the various communities because we noticed that the communities along the St. Paul rely on the St. Paul for drinking, for washing. So any I mean, contamination in St. Paul will have an adverse effect on the community. Over 20 wells and hand pumps were constructed or repaired as part of the project's interventions in public health. A pay-for-use latrine was also installed next to the market outside the project site. Before the inauguration of this latrine, a vast of the community emitted using the bush and using the river for defecation. But right now, people are coming, using it, and they feel proud. Females can come, they are no more afraid that they are going in the bush and somebody is following them. So uh, the response is, 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 is immense. At the beginning of the project, the public health clinic serving the area around Mount Coffee was in a deplorable state and could only operate during daylight hours, providing limited treatments and preventative services. The closest 24-hour clinics were more than an hour away by car. Therefore, improving local public health services were project priorities. The extension of the clinic will be able to help us to be able to give proper care to our MCH. It will also be able to help us to monitor our patients after delivery, like the postnatal ward. Then we never had a place for lab. We have only been doing RDT, which is a rapid diagnosis test to confirm whether the patient is malaria positive. Now it will be able to help us to probe in our patient diagnosis. 
Ensuring the plant's sustainability was a major project priority. In August 2016, LEC contracted Hydro Operation International HOI, of Switzerland to operate and maintain the hydro plant for a five-year period while training LEC staff to eventually take over this function. HOI and LEC began taking over the completed parts of the powerhouse, dam, and spillway as 2017 progressed. HOI will continue to supervise activities at the hydropower plant through 2021. But if their training exceeds expectations, it is possible that full responsibility for operation and maintenance of the plant can be handed over to LEC sooner. We are now on this point that we are giving to the staff this on-the-job training. We are working together for each maintenance. We are working together if there is a corrective maintenance necessary. In addition to this on-the-job training, also classroom training, so-called theory. We are having on-site training that is uh, along with our mentors. We day-to-day -day work along with them. Whatever questions we have to ask, we ask them. And uh, as we observe things around, we ask uh, basically based on what we think we need to know also. With the level of mentorship we're having and uh, the level of observation and questions we keep asking, I believe we can handle things the best way possible. We can run the plan. The Mount Coffee project provides the only crossing of the St. Paul River for 25 miles downstream and 100 miles upstream. During pre-war times, the public was allowed to cross through the site over the top of the dam. After the new facility was constructed, new measures were necessary to protect the dam and the critical power infrastructure from road accidents, theft, and vandalism while preserving the access routes for the surrounding communities. This led to the introduction of a new bridge over the tail race channel and a new road that was routed away from the powerhouse, four bay dams and intake structure. Fencing was expanded to protect both the public and the infrastructure and other security upgrades such as closed circuit television were included. The tail race bridge was constructed to, to separate the public access from the Mount Coffee project site. Um, this was done to ensure that the project has control and a degree of safety when it comes to operations of its own site. Erosion protection measures were carried out along the shoreline of the reservoir to prevent pollution of the water body and safeguard the storage capacity of the reservoir. By the end of July 2018, nearly all of the project construction works were completed. The project delivered four new turbines, 10 refurbished spillway gates, a new substation, and a control system that allowed operators to control the spillway gates and substation from the central control room in the powerhouse. Two new high voltage transmission lines connected the Mount Coffee plant to Monrovia. The dam safety was significantly improved with a higher dam and the introduction of an emergency spillway. The environmental health of the country and the livelihood of the people living around the project site was significantly improved and the financing for over 80% of these achievements was provided free of charge to the government of Liberia by its international partners. It was now time to officially hand over the completed hydro plant to LEC. Uh, we've now basically got all four units operational and Mount Coffee has been supplying probably 85% of the energy this year to the grid. Um, basically, we're done. Um, the project's pretty much delivered. To see the pictures of the pre-war plant and then to see the hydropower house in 2016, it's just really hard to fathom how we were able to do all of that in three years.
the rehabilitation of the Mount Coffee Hydro Power Plant will greatly reshape the future of Liberia. Dark street corners have been transformed into lit avenues. Presence of street lights is an indicator of the changes electricity has brought to the country, one of which is the ability to feel safer at night. The hydro, it will do a lot in making this country to develop from a state of poverty to a state of prosperity, that our country will flourish, that our economy will grow, more money will go into the pockets of Liberians. Many business owners who once used generators as their primary source of power can now rely on the national grid. And the cost of electricity has been reduced from 59 cents per kilowatt hour to a more affordable 35 cents. When we were in central Moroya, we only depend on generators, people running generators, who you are paying about 40 to 50 dollars per hour. But since LEC return back into Moravia, we pay very less. So it's impacting our businesses because we deal with a whole lot of digital machines and industrial equipment. So when we pay for the current, it lasts all long and we enjoy it. Prior to the rehabilitation of the Mount Coffee hydropower plant, the Liberia Electricity Corporation could only generate 22 megawatts of power from high-speed diesel generators, which were supplemented with additional capacity from heavy fuel oil plants in 2016 and 2017. These sources cost LEC's consumers and the environment dearly. Now, LEC is capable of generating almost 88 megawatts from the hydropower facility alone. LDC is committed to increasing access to electricity. Now that we have our man coffee on full swing, just recently over the last two months, we're able to connect 120 businesses. So it tells you that businesses are more comfortable now using the LDC than a private general generator, which is more expensive. As a businessman, you always look at your cost. The more your cost, the more you price up your goods or services. Exactly. Yeah, so because LEC, we have reduced most of the things we do. During the dry season, there is insufficient river flow to allow Mount Coffee to meet its full potential. However, the government, along with its international partners, is conducting feasibility studies to construct an upstream reservoir that would allow for year-round generation at Mount Coffee and further development of hydropower along the St. Paul River. Already there are feasibilities afoot to improve the operation of Mount Coffee by supplementing that with a dam upstream, for example. Once that large storage capacity is available upstream, then we will be able to implement further hydropower projects as the demand grows to reach ultimately four or five million people. Meanwhile, LEC's top priority is ensuring that the power generated at Mount Coffee is distributed across the capital to an increasing number of people as quickly as possible. Other plans to supply electricity to counties outside the capital are also underway. We've secured over $200 million to be able to run the lines, transmission and distribution lines, as well as connections. So if you look around Liberia right now, if you look at Kakata, we have the line going there. We've secured money for Bummy, uh, the Bummy corridor, which will go from Caldwell all the way past Bummy. Uh, we're also doing the Monrovia consolidation, which is connecting 38,000 homes in and around Monrovia. As many more homes, businesses, and industrial ventures continue to get connected to the national grid, the use of diesel generators will decline, which will reduce air pollution and contribute to the health of the country and its people. Liberia will, be, will become a promising place. Prosperity will begin to abound. We feel that we've laid the foundation. We've taken all the hard knocks of what it takes to start a country from, from zero to where we are now. And Liberia will be in the position now
to start to become an industrialized nation, as we now find with some of our neighboring countries. At the end of the day, the 88 megawatts is going to be here and deliver ample power for all of Monrovia, ample power for the immediate surroundings around Monrovia, ample power for the government should they decide to uh, export power, they have that liberty to do it. So, uh, my coffee is, is, is an economic machine. The challenge for LEC going forward is to ensure that Mount Coffee is properly operated and maintained over the long term and that the utility continues to improve its operational efficiency and reach. Many people are asking me how can you do so much work and so much money for only 100 megawatts. But I think we have to start that small in Liberia because you can't produce too much power, too much electricity before you have the grid developed as well. Because you need to get this electricity out to people and uh, that takes time. And I think development of the infrastructure, development of the electricity and the development of the society at large has to go hand in hand. My hopes for energy sector of Liberia is that the very ambitious electrification plan of the country goes forward with the uh, same resolve that was shown in the Mount Coffee project. And after that one, I hope development, peace and uh, prosperity to the library. We are interested in this project because it will help bring costs down. And we know that more affordable energy will lead to greater connections for the people. It will mean hospitals have the capacity to run at night. We hope and we expect to see some savings uh, on that. Um, and MCC is solely focused on how do we create economic growth um, and how do we address poverty through that. If you think, yeah, when we came here in the beginning, there were 24 megawatts of energy implemented and we had 4,000 customers. Meanwhile, we have over 40,000 and we have 88 megawatts of energy implemented. That is, that is that's great, it's 400% growth. A big thank you to all our partners. It couldn't have happened without them. Liberia could not have done the hydro on its own, with its own resources. And so we, we continue to appreciate them and we hope that that partnership will continue and Liberia will get to the place where it can become a helping hand to other countries as we have received a helping hand from our partners. Liberia, a nation whose economy has been crippled by long years of civil crisis, coupled with a devastating health crisis, now has the opportunity for a fresh start. With the hydro back online and the development of the nation on a strong path, the country must maintain the momentum of economic growth and empower the citizens of Liberia to improve their outlook and quality of life. It was for the people of Liberia and the promise of a better future that the many stakeholders on the project dedicated their resources and energy. Yeah.